Good morning and a, well, and a warm welcome to the third and final day of the conference. As is customary, I would like to thank the, the Rimini Cent the, our sponsors, the Rimini Center for Economic Analysis, the Tax Administration Research Center, IOVE, the International Association of Applied Econometrics, Swiss Marine, the Cyprus International Institute of Management, and the Ministry of Finance of Cyprus. Special thanks go to the, uh, uh, to the University of Cyprus the the conference with this conference would not have been possible without its resources and without the work of its people i would like to thank personally yanis kasaris and kaya christu from the from the university of cyprus and chris skotsoyanis and helen spalding for their incredibly hard work over the last few over the last few weeks finally i would like to thank our plenary speakers and some uh, some of whom uh, were contacted completely out of the blue and uh, responded with heartwarming kindness and supported our cause with dropping everything they had to do. In one response, uh, in, in one of these responses, Leat Yariv said, I don't know Miltos Makris personally, but he must be a very special person. He most certainly is. I would, uh, uh, I would, uh, I would, and I would like to pass on to Christos Kotsorians to introduce the first speaker. Christos. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Tassos. And uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, uh, to all of you, uh, you know, you know, wherever you join us from. Uh, you know, welcome to the third day of the, uh, of the conference, the third to the first keynote uh, lecture of the day, which will be given by, uh, you know, Mick Keen. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to you, uh, as Mick has played a, a significant part in my academic journey as a PhD advisor, mentor, and co-author. Uh, you know, Mick also, uh, for those of you who don't know that, uh, supervised part of, uh, you know, Mendes Macrosis in a PhD thesis, uh, you know, back in the uh, late 90s, uh, you know, while he was a professor of economics at the University of Essex. Uh, Mick is uh, currently, uh, a uh, Yoshioda Fellow at uh, Tokyo College, uh, University of Tokyo, having previously been Deputy Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the uh, International Monetary Fund. Um, he has an extensive uh, experience in uh, uh, providing technical assistance uh, uh, missions to uh, countries, having done that for, I believe, over 30 countries uh, and on a wide range of uh, issues in tax policy. Um, Mick has been uh, uh, incredible in terms of uh, you know doing both things. Uh, you know, writing academic papers uh, that have been uh, you know highly cited, um, but at the same time, um, you know, doing uh, you know you know policy policy work. Um, uh, for that, he has been uh, uh, the recipient of the Daniel uh, you know Holland Medal of the National Tax Association in uh, 2018. Uh, and has been uh, awarded the CSC for IAPF, uh, you know, much great prize in uh, 2010 for his contribution to public finance. Uh, he's also the uh, honorary president of the uh, International Institute of Public Finance. Um, as I said, he has uh, published widely across a broad range of public finance issues, uh, you know, from you know, tax competition, having done uh, impressive work on the, on, on the topic and one of the most you know, Frequently cited papers, and he has written, um, uh, you know, back in 20, uh, 2002, I believe. Uh, you know, he has worked on uh, tax harmonization, uh, you know, value added taxes, again, uh, having done a frequently cited paper uh, on innovative know, thresholds. Uh, he has worked on business taxation, uh, fiscal decentralization, and climate change, and the list goes on. Uh, he's a uh, uh, co-author of books. Uh, he has written uh, a book on the modern VAT, uh, which is, uh, you know, the Bible of you know, VAT, uh, for those interested in the topic. Uh, the taxation of you know, petroleum and minerals and changing customs. Uh, more recently, uh, he has done something completely different. Uh, he has co-authored, uh, together with uh, Joel Slemrod, a book titled Rebellion, Rascals and Revenue. Tax Follies and Wisdom Through the Ages, uh, which is uh, a very rare attempt uh, to make tax fun, tax fun and, and interesting. Uh, but I think, I think they have achieved that uh, in the book, uh, certainly. 
Uh, Mick, you know, many, uh, many thanks for accepting our invitation to give a plenary lecture. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, well, thanks very much, Christos and Tessa. That's a very kind introduction. Um, it's really uh, very happy to be here, have to have been asked to talk. Uh, I have very happy memories of um, back in Essex with, with um, Christos and uh, Meltos. It was kind of, um, it's always a great pleasure when you have such smart PhD students and then watch them go on to do uh, to do such great things. So I'm very proud and, uh, and happy to be here today. So I'm gonna be talking about some international tax issues, really carrying on the kind of stream of work that um, uh, Christos mentioned. And let me just try and find my cursor and then I can maybe uh, figure out, oh, there we go. Maybe share my screen. See, uh, tell me if this is working. Uh, yes, yes. How's that? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we can. Great. Okay, so it's a paper with a slightly boring, intimidating title, Pareto Improving Minimum Corporate Taxation, joint with um, my colleague Shafiq um, at the IMF. Um, he still has to enter this IMF disclaimer at the bottom. I no longer do, so um, uh, that's, a, that's a great pleasure for me. So just to say, then, what's this, um, what's this going to be about? So it's basically prompted by... Um, or comes out of something you may have heard of, even if you're not really a public finance person. Last, excuse me, last October, you may have read about a kind of um, a, a historic, the newspapers will have said, a historic agreement to reform the international corporate tax system. Um, this was in October 2021, and it was an agreement by something called the Inclusive Framework, an agreement in principle by something called the Inclusive Framework, which is about 140 countries um, to, as we say, as I say, reform the international tax architecture. And as I say, the, the press will have said, well, this was a historic agreement. Uh, OECD, G20 will have said how important it was. And actually for once, that wasn't really an exaggeration. It actually is quite a historic agreement. Uh, it's called a two pillar agreement because it has two parts. Pillar one, what's called pillar one, really allocates profits across multinationals in a different way from the thing that's been standard for more or less 100 years. So it allocates profits partly by formula. That is, instead of by trying to allocate profits within multinationals using what's called arm's length pricing, kind of invent prices at which you think bits of the multinational traded with each other, you basically use a, a, a kind of a, a, a formulaic method to share out profits between the elements in a multinational. That's unprecedented. Moreover, it allocates taxing rights in part to countries where the multinational may have no physical presence at all, may just be selling things. And that's called the destination country. And now under the proposed new arrangement, some profits will be allocated by destination. So those are huge changes, but I'm actually concentrating in this paper on the second element, pillar two of the agreement, which is equally uh, a landmark. This was the agreement that the, it basically multinational entities should face, wherever they operate, a minimum effective tax rate of 50, 15%. So it's trying to put a really a floor on profit shifting, on the artificial shifting of uh, profits to where they are taxed at a low rate. And that profit shifting concern and the idea that, well, profit shifting has also exacerbated tax competition between countries because in order to attract paper profits, countries have cut their tax rates, um, you know, either to attract it or either to attract shifted profits or prevent profits being shifted elsewhere. So this is really an agreement. The second pillar is trying to put a, a floor, uh, some kind of limit on the extent of downward tax competition. So that's kind of really, these are really kind of actually historic agreements for once the hype is actually pretty much uh, correct. So as I say, I'm focusing in this paper with Shafiq on the second pillar, the pillar, the, the minimum effective rate, 15%. So the question really that comes up, of course, and came up very quickly in the negotiations of this is, well, okay, if you're setting a minimum tax rate to try and put a limit to profit shifting and tax competition, what should the rate be? How do you pick what the number is? How do you pick 15%? Uh, what might, why might that be a sensible rate or not? And as you can imagine, negotiations over the level, the actual level of the minimum, were very, very contentious. So many low tax countries 
were strongly resistant even to 15 percent uh, they felt that was going to be too high to damage would damage their interests on the other hand many people would see 15 percent as far too low um, the quote here is, I think, from the uh, Minister of Finance from Argentina, who wanted not less than 21 percent, uh, would have preferred 25 percent. Lots of civil society organizations and others would see this rate as really far too, far too low. So poses a question, well, how would you think about what an appropriate level for the minimum rate might be? And that's really what we're trying to do in this in this paper, to try and come up with some kind of welfare basis to think about what the level of the minimum rate should be, and even ideally to give some sense of what kind of numbers uh, we might be talking about. So that's basically what we're trying to do here. Uh, so what are the kind of issues that we focus on? Well, the kind of common sense view, and of course, when I say common sense, I'm probably about, about to say, as you can guess, that this may well be wrong. So certainly you might think that the high tax countries, the ones that are not going to be constrained by the minimum, you might expect them to gain from the imposition of the minimum because there's going to be less outward profit shifting. And indeed, clearly, this whole process was driven by the relatively high tax countries. It wasn't driven by the low tax countries who wanted to impose a minimum. It was driven by the high tax countries. And we're not really going to focus on the high tax countries much because I think um, we could see very clearly why they may well expect to gain. And it seems quite plausible that they would. Uh, on the other hand, uh, common sense might suggest, well, look, if you're a low tax country below 15 percent and you're forced to raise your rate, well, you'll be pushed away from your preferred rate. Surely you're going to be made worse off. But I'm sure you can see the difficulty with that argument. The difficulty with that argument is, well, actually, you may be forced off your rate, but the countries that are not constrained. They're going to change their behavior, too. And that is going to have some impact on the countries that are constrained. And indeed, the previous literature on minimum taxation has shown that this kind of strategic response by high tax countries means that actually the low tax countries, and by low tax country, I mean ones that are constrained, may also gain. So when we think about the welfare implications of minimum rates, we uh, want to explore the idea that the strategic response of the high tax countries may actually be important to figure out what's going on, and in particular, what happens to the interests of the, of the lower tax countries. So what we're trying to do in this model is to characterize um, in a setting that generalizes the previous uh, previous Camber-Keen model, some people may know, we try to characterize two kind of critical levels of the minimum rate. One is the level that is going to be most preferred by the low tax country. So the idea is going to be that, well, with the strategic response, there is going to be some potential gain to the low tax country from a minimum. Eventually, however, the minimum is going to damage its interests. So we conceive of some level that is most preferred by the, by the low tax countries. And that's going to be the Pareto efficient minimum rate, because we think the, we're kind of in the background, we're always thinking, and it'll be the case in the model, that the high tax countries always gain as the minimum's increased. So one critical level is the one that's most preferred by the, yeah, by the low tax country. The second one is, well, even if uh, you were to push the rate beyond the level most preferred by the minimum, by the low-tax country, you may still leave the low-tax country better off than it was in the absence of the minimum. That is, there's some even higher rate that will leave the low-tax country better off than in the uncoordinated Nash equilibrium. So that's going to be what we'll call the maximally dominant uh, minimum rate. So that's the highest level of the rate you can set of the minimum rate that you can set and still leave the uh, low tax country better off than in the absence of coordination. And I'm going to explain all these things a little bit more in detail as we go through, but this is just to kind of give you the big, the big picture. Should say a little bit about the, 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 the literature that we draw on. Uh, I've mentioned that we're kind of going to be really generalizing the Kemba Key model, which was initially a model of, was usually interpreted as a model of cross-border shopping. Uh, we're going to focus on the case where countries play Nash. There's a couple of papers that look at the case uh, where um, one of the countries in our, the two country world we're going to be looking at is a Stachelberg leader. And uh, I could possibly come back to that later. It's actually quite an interesting case, but it's not the one that we focus on. There's a couple of more recent papers kind of also motivated by this uh, inclusive framework agreement. Uh, Jim Hines has a paper that looks not at Pareto efficiency, but at efficiency kind of collective, kind of potential Pareto improvement. Imagine there might be compensating transfers between two countries. Uh, Niels Johansson has a paper which 
has the feature that the uh, low tax country, the lowest tax countries, actually set a rate of zero. Um, we can come back to that case too. Uh, I think our view would tend to be, well, actually not many low tax uh, countries actually have a rate of zero. And if they, those that do generally collect revenue from other sources that reflect the degree of profit shifting. There is some empirical work, mainly on the revenue impact of the minimum tax rate, but there's also some uh, on investment effects that's beginning to, that's beginning to emerge. But I'm, I'm not gonna be talking about the, the revenue and investment effects um, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. So that's by way of uh, introduction. Um, of course, if anyone has any questions as we go along, I'm happy to take them if I spot a hand or someone jumps in. But let me then, if that kind of makes broadly sense, let me get into the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the analysis. So here's the, uh, here are the key assumptions that we're gonna be using uh, in building the model. Uh, there's some brackets gone awry there, sorry. So as I say, there's gonna be two countries and the notational convention is that the country that ends up setting the lower tax rate in equilibrium uh, is denoted by lowercase letters. So for example, a little tn being strictly less than big tn, that's a little t because uh, that's the low tax country setting the lower rate and just indicates the Nash equilibrium. So we have these two countries, they're gonna differ in two ways. They may differ in their relative size uh, in the sense of in, captured by this parameter theta. What I mean here by size is essentially the extent of multinational profits accruing to their own citizen residents. So this is the kind of the local multinationals profits, uh, which we take as a kind of indicator of size. If you think about comparing, I don't know, the US with um, Sweden or something. Uh, they're gonna differ too in the marginal value of, of public spending or in this context, tax revenue. So little lambda is going to be the valuation of tax revenue in the low tax country, uh, uppercase lambda in the high tax country, both are going to be strictly greater than one, so that, you know, we have some, some reason for levying taxes in the first place. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the three country case at the end, uh, if, if, uh, if there's time. We're going to ignore investment effects. Um, that's not uh, trivial because there is a small literature that shows that actually profit shifting in itself can make investment more attractive, which is intuitive because when you indulge in profit shifting activities, you're basically reducing your tax burden. You'd expect that would reduce your cost of capital and lead to lead to more investment. Nonetheless, I think uh, we focus, we put real investment aside because really the whole debate has been about paper profit shifting. Uh, hasn't really been much focus on investment, but um, uh, we can also come back to that if you like. We assume, as in most tax competition models, that uh, the tax is levied on a source basis. That is, uh, the, the multinational is essentially taxed uh, where it, uh, it's going to be taxed where it declares profits, not by where it's resident. Um, I should say a little bit about the politics of that. There was, in this whole, if we step back a bit and think about minimum taxation in principle, you can impose a minimum tax in either of two ways. You could have the source country where the profits are earned. You could have that country levy a top-up tax to reach the minimum. Or you could have the residence country, the country where the multinational comes from. You could have that jurisdiction levy the top-up tax. And there was a lot of debate in this whole process uh, about which kind of what order you should do these things in, what was called the rule order uh, issue. But in fact, it's pretty clear that if you're a source country, you have a strong incentive to reach to top up to the minimum yourself, because if you don't top up to the minimum and the residence country does, all you're doing is giving up revenue to the uh, to the height to the, to the residence country with no impact on investors. So it was clear and it's made clear in negotiations that low tax countries, whatever the formal rule order was, they were gonna top up themselves and that's now actually been made much clearer in, in the model rules. So I think this is a reasonable assumption that uh, essentially it's the source country that brings uh, the overall tax rate up to the minimum. There are other features of the agreement, sorry, missed out a T there, that we also ignore. There's, for example, a carve out, which says that, well, we won't apply the minimum. Well, we, we will apply the minimum only to some excess over a level of profit where it reflects how much real activity is going on that reflects your payroll, your, uh, your capital stock, your tangible assets. So we'll only impose the minimum of once you've essentially taken out a reasonable return on those assets, various other features we ignore too. So we're, we're certainly 
simplifying relative to uh, much of the detail of the agreement. So, so before we get into the uh, nuts and bolts of the model, maybe just to fix ideas, let's just talk for a moment about uh, what we might think the welfare impact of a minimum rate might be in general. So imagine we have a low tax country, we have a high tax country. Let's imagine to begin with, we impose a minimum that is uh, binding, of course, only on the low tax country, but it's only very slightly binding. It only forces the, the low tax country to raise its, its rate by a tiny infinitesimal amount relative to the, the uncoordinated uh, Nash equilibrium. Well, what happens to, to uh, welfare in the two countries? Well, let's take, uh, well, of course, first point to note is that since we're, we're gonna be looking at a straightforward sort of Nash equilibrium, so by an envelope property, uh, essentially all that matters is the change in the other person's tax rate, because you're essentially on your best response function, uh, your own response or what the change in your own tax rate makes no difference to your welfare. And that's true of both low and high tax countries. So it's always the cross effect it's only the cross effect that matters for these infinitesimal changes. Well, for the high test country, which is the first equation on the left, the big W, uh, well, what happens? W sub T, that's the effect of, a, of an increase in the tax rate in the low tax country on welfare in the high tax country. Well, we'd expect that WT is actually going to be positive because when the low tax country increases its tax rate, that reduces profit shifting out of the high tax country which is good for the high test country because it's now having its revenue dissipated less. So uh, we would expect on the left that the uh, high test country benefits for the reasons that, same reasons I was saying below uh, earlier. What about the low test country on the, on the right? Well, again, we just look at what happens to the rate in the low test country. Um, well, we have the, the partial effect WT, w, little w sub big T, now that we would also uh, expect to be positive on the grounds that if you're the low tax country, uh, when the high tax country increases its tax rate, that's great for you because that just induces more profit shifting into your, into your country. So W sub T is positive, but um, we're gonna have another effect because as we were saying earlier, but informally, the high tax country uh, is gonna change its rate uh, in response to uh, the, the increase in the low tax country. But the extent to which it does that is going to depend on what its best response function looks like. So big T uh, prime, that's essentially the derivative of the best response function of the high tax country to the rate in the low tax, uh, rate set in the low tax country. So essentially, we're going to be telling a story in which the rate goes up in the high tax country. But um, uh, essentially how much it goes up depends on the slope of this best response of T prime N. So uh, going through the, the various bullet elements in the, in the bullets there, profit shifting context, reasonable that each gains from a tax increase in the other. That's saying both these WT uh, term, W sub T terms are positive. So we think the high tax country is gonna gain at least from this moderate infinitesimal minimum. Of course, I've been assuming here in, in describing this that T prime is positive which basic big T prime is positive, which is saying that uh, essentially when the rate in the low tax country goes up, then the response of the high tax country is to raise its rate too. That is corporate tax rates, if T prime is positive, are strategic complements uh, as far as the high tax country is concerned. Actually, the evidence on that is fairly mixed. Um, uh, people try to figure out the slope of reaction functions of various measures of, of corporate tax rates. But I think in terms of statutory tax rates, it's probably not a bad assumption that this thing is upward sloping. Uh, we give a couple of sites there. So essentially what we would, that the empirical literature would be my basis for thinking that T prime is positive. And therefore uh, that when we increase from the, um, uh, from the minimum, when we impose an infinitesimal minimum, both countries gain. So the, the point of interest here, of course, is that the more striking point, I think is that low, the low tax country is gaining even though it's being forced away from its best response, it's being constrained, but nonetheless, because of the response of the high tax country, it's, being, uh, it's ending up better off. So that's all for infinitesimal uh, minima, or, in, or minima that are infinitesimally above the uh, uncoordinated rate in the low tax country. Of course, in the real world, we're not talking about infinitesimal uh, uh, minimum rates. We want to be able to say something about discrete rates. We want, if we want to address this question of where the minimum should be set, Obviously, we need to go beyond these kind of uh, very uh, marginal uh, results. 
So that I think brings us to uh, say a little bit more detail about the nuts and bolts of the model. So where do we start? Well, let's start with the, with the multinational. Uh, now in principle, there's a multinational in each of these countries, the high tax and the low tax country, but the only profit shifting going on is gonna be from the high tax country to the low tax country. So let's look uh, at uh, what's going on for the multinational in the high tax country. Well, it's pre-tax profits right at the end of that first equation are big pie, that's his pre-tax profits. Uh, but we need to figure out where uh, some tax payments go. Well, let's denote by S the proportion of those profits that are shifted to the low tax country. Then the second term of that equation is saying is the T, the little t s. That's the tax paid on the profits that are shifted to the low tax country. The third term, one minus s big T, that's the tax paid on the profits that are not shifted to the low tax country. And then we have a cost of shifting. We assume there is a cost of shifting profits, which is given by this uh, parameterized by delta, strictly positive. So delta over two times s squared, that's a kind of a standard form, um, a convenient and standard commonly assumed form for profit shifting costs. What's going on? Well, the multinational is gonna choose s to maximize profits. Uh, so you can just derive a little first order condition for that, uh, for the choice of the proportion of profits shifted f, s, and then put that into the expression for the welfare of the low tax country, which is a little expression, little w expression here. So in the middle of the screen, what does welfare of the low tax country consist of? Well, there's two parts to it. First, one minus little t times little pi. That's essentially the private income that its citizens get from the multinational of the low tax country. The second term is the tax revenue weighted by lambda, which remember is the marginal valuation of spending or tax revenue. Lambda t, so we have tax revenue. So where does tax come from? First, it comes from domestic profits, pi. And secondly, that big T minus little t term, that's the, the uh, extent of profit shifting. So those are the profits, those, sorry, that second term in brackets is the revenue that's collected from uh, profit shifting into the low tax country. So what happens uh, in the uncoordinated equilibrium, the low tax country simply chooses uh, its preferred little t, and we can figure out that it has a best response that looks like the equation at the bottom of the screen. Don't really want to say much about that. Um, those of you who know these things will see that that's a kind of a generalization of, uh, of what's in Canberra Keen. Canberra Keen is pure revenue maximizing. So you recover that by setting uh, these lambdas to uh, infinity, let them go to infinity. That's a small country, relatively straightforward. Um, let's go to the high tax country. Well, you do the same thing for the a similar kind of thing for the high tax country. Um, you, it gets the first term here is going to be uh, it, the net income from, um, uh, from, well, let, let me step back a bit. It's a bit more complicated um, because we have the outward profit shifting to take care of. Uh, it's a little bit different from the high test country. But a um, couple of things to notice here. There's a term in the middle, which has that um, uh, half in red um, multiplying it. That is basically captures the private gain from profit shifting. Notice there's no lambda on that term. That's what the citizen shareholders in a country, in a high tax country gain by being able to shift profits to the low tax jurisdiction. Other terms simply capture, you know, the, the remaining other net private income and uh, the revenue collected from such profit shifting, uh, oh, sorry, revenue collected from such profits as are not shifted to the low tax country. Now, actually in the paper, we changed that somewhat arbitrarily, but we think, uh, with some justification, generalizing it in, in one respect, by replacing that red half by a parameter alpha, which, sub which is less than half, but strictly positive. The argument there, let me see if you buy it or not, is that actually governments show some aversion to the private gain from profit shifting. Uh, there's many people draw a very thin line between evasion and avoidance. This is what kind of what people are doing here is is um, uh, clearly illegal, legal, but is clearly also in many respects. You think about people talking about tax dodging, illicit financing. People kind of and policymakers, I think, to some degree, combine evasion and avoidance in ways that um, imply a kind of a, um, an aversion to both in some form. So. One way to think about this is if this were pure evasion, you might say, well, I don't want to give full weight to, to the private gain from evasion. Um, this isn't evasion, it's avoidance, but 
many people seem to attach much uh, rather similar uh, disapprobation to that. Anyway, you'll see what happens uh, as a consequence of parameter alpha. And then we can figure out same kind of way, maximize this with respect to big T, you get the best response of the high test country um, being this expression here, which again, not particularly interesting in itself, just a couple of things to note. Um, what will turn out to be important is if you kind of eyeball, imagine differentiating that big T of little t term at the bottom with respect to little t, which gives you the slope of the best response function of the high test country, <coughs> excuse me, um, you, can see, you can see that really just depends on the ratio of alpha to big lambda. Um, you can imagine just dividing the, that second term in brackets by, by uh, big lambda. Essentially what matters is alpha over lambda. What is that? That's the, that's the social valuation of the private gain from profit shifting to the social valuation of the revenue loss as a consequence of profit shifting. And that's going to be uh, important uh, in, in, what fell, in what follows. So that's all pretty mechanical. Um, and just by way of what's the benchmark in all this, well, you can look for the intersection of those two best responses. And essentially, if this condition here um, holds, then there's only one equilibrium in which uh, my initial kind of presumption that the low test country sets a lower rate turns out to be right, uh, in which uh, there's only one such equilibrium in which uh, the low tax rate happens to be given by this. I'm not going to go through the comparative statics, which are kind of pretty straightforward, except this term alpha has some slightly strange, uh, surprising uh, effects. But again, I'm not showing that to you because it's particularly interesting, but just to show to make the point that we can, as our benchmark, we take this um, Nash equilibrium, sort of one shot game in which uh, um, you know we can find there's just one um, equilibrium that we can take as our benchmark. So then, it gets more interesting when we say, well, now we come along and we're going to impose a minimum tax at a rate mu. And this rate is going to bind the low tax country. It's not going to bind the high tax country, although I'll come back to that as a footnote uh, later. So what happens? Well, now welfare of the high tax country, what is that? Welfare of the high tax country depends on its own tax rate that is set in response to the minimum tax rate, because the minimum tax rate is what the low country sets. So welfare in the high country depends on mu on its own, because that is welfare, that is the rate set in the low tax country. And it depends on T of mu, because that is the rate that the high tax country optimally sets in response to mu. And differentiating that, I'm not going to bore you with the details, that one turns out to be um, everywhere increasing in mu. So going back to what I was saying earlier, it kind of uh, turns out to be the case in this model that the high tax country always prefers the minimum to be as high as it possibly can be. Things are a bit more interesting for the low tax country. Um, so now, um, again, I'll spare you the details, but we can write, you know, going back to, uh, if I go back to, where is it? Yeah, so this equation in the middle, uh, so welfare in the, high, in the uh, low tax country in the presence of the minimum, I just replace little t by mu because that's the rate it's gonna be obliged to set and I replace big T by big T as a function of mu, that is the best response of the high tax country. And that gives me um, an expression for uh, little w as a function of mu. Again, the rate that the low tax country sets itself and T of mu, the rate the high tax country sets in response. And we could just differentiate that. And what you get is that there are three effects, A, B, and C very uh, creatively labeled here. So what is effect A? Well, A is certainly positive, um, but that essentially is the revenue, the increased revenue that the low tax country gets by taxing its own domestic tax base. Remember, there's some multinational we assume in the low tax country. That multinational declares all its profits in the low tax country. So if you increase its rate, there is a gain from that to the extent that um, lambda exceeds one, meaning that the marginal value of revenue exceeds one, which is what we have to have it for any taxation to make any sense. So there's a gain there to the low tax country. What about, uh, what's this term B? Well, this T minus mu term in the brackets there, that is the thing that shapes how much profit shifting there is. The, the bigger the tax differential T minus mu, the more profit shifting there is. So T minus mu describes how much profit shifting there is. 
And what's going on there, again, you see the lambda term is something to do with tax revenue. That says that when the low tax country increases its tax rate, um, to the it raises more revenue from whatever profit shifting remains. From the remaining profit shifting, it gets more revenue. Um, remember the point I was making earlier that we assume the minimum revenue for the minimum rate always goes to the, to the uh, source country, the low tax country in this case. So there's another gain. So to the extent that profit shifting continues, you benefit in the low tax country. However, the third term, which has this T prime, and I should have pointed out T prime is always less than one. That is when the low tax country increases its rate, the high tax country increases its rate in this model, but by less than one. So T prime minus one is negative. So there's a negative effect. What's going on there? Well, that simply is saying profit shifting goes down. And to the extent that profit shifting goes down because of the minimum, that's a source of loss for the low tax country. So we have these three effects. How do we think they might play out? Well, intuitively, you might expect the effect to look a little bit uh, a little bit like this. And this is this actually turns out to be the case in this in this model. So down the bottom, we have the level of the minimum rate. Ignore those ones with PCPL when, and, and you. We're not. We're, I'm going to refer to those, but they're not the important thing here. On the left-hand axis, it should have been a little W. This is showing the level of welfare of the, of the low tax country. So what happens is you imagine increasing mu from the left. Well, initially nothing happens if the minimum is less than the rate that the uh, small country sets in the Nash equilibrium TM. Then we start to exceed that rate and those first two terms actually dominate, which is consistent with what I was saying earlier on that you know, for an infinitesimal uh, minimum, one just above TN, we can be sure the low country, get low tax country gains. And for a while that continues to go on until that last term in that we had before, the, the, the reduction in profit shifting starts to exactly balance or comes to outweigh and before that exactly balances those two positive effects in, uh, in, uh, in terms A and B. So that gives you this point mu star where the welfare of the high tax of the low tax country, I'm sorry, is maximized. And so that's what I was calling earlier the Pareto efficient minimum rate. So mu star, the peak of this function is the Pareto efficient uh, minimum rate. As we increase the minimum rate still further beyond that level, that third term now comes to dominate and welfare starts to fall. But importantly, um, it's still above the level WN in the uh, pre-minimum rate of the, un the un sort of uncoordinated equilibrium, the welfare is still higher <coughs> for the low tax country until you reach this point mu star star. So mu double star is what I was calling earlier the maximally dominant uh, Pareto, uh, the maximally dominant minimum rate. That is, mu star is the highest level at which you can set the minimum and still leave the low tax country better off than it was in the absence of the minimum. So mu star, mu star, star are the kind of critical things here. And um, what we do in the model is uh, you can solve for the critical levels uh, of these two things. Um, it's convenient that that W function does indeed turn out to be quadratic. So we use that particularly for, for the mu star star. And I'm not going to bore you with the actual kind of closed forms for these, uh, for these results, for the, for the characterizations, because they're, well, they're, they're not for a Sunday morning, they're not especially uh, enlightening. Um, but the neat thing uh, is it turns out that um, these two things on the slide are true. That is both rates can be expressed as very simple multiples of the low tax rate, of the set of the low tax rate in the Nash equilibrium. That is, if you tell me what uh, little TN was, uh, the rate in the, in the uncoordinated equilibrium, and you tell me basically the, the big gamma and the, the little alpha, then we can figure out exactly what mu star and mu star star uh, are. So that's quite a convenient characterization, I think, in two, two respects. One is it, it again makes clear, I think, um, what I think becomes intuitively apparent through this exercise that the key thing here is really the slope of the best response of the, of the high test country, uh, big T uh, of little t. Because again, you can see that the things multiplying TN in these equations. They both just depend on the ratio of alpha to big lambda. And as we saw earlier, alpha over big lambda is what determines the slope of the best response. So we bring these things bring out this, the, the slope of the best response function, I think rather neatly as being a key thing. 
Um, and of course, another nice thing is this really lends itself to um, uh, very simple illustrative calculations. For example, we can fix, and I'll lift out the critical number here, suppose we take Tn to be 12.5%. Why do I say 12.5%? Because that was something of a focal number in the debate. That was the tax rate in Ireland. Uh, and that became really a focal point when people were thinking about what should the rate be. I think they were often starting with the presumption, well, we have Ireland at 12.5%, and let's think what we do from there. So with that, and I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to go through this, you can figure out um, for alternative uh, parameter values for the lambdas and for the, uh, for the for relative scale parameter theta and alpha, you can figure out, for example, what the, you can figure out, and again, I'm not going to go through the numbers, but just to give you a sense of what you can do, you can figure out exactly what mu star is, uh, you can figure out what mu double star is, and you can figure out all other things that might, that might change. Some of these things on the table I'm not going to talk about, but for example, uh, let me just give you the sort of uh, thing that comes out here. Um, again, so suppose we're taking uh, uh, TN to be 12.5%. And suppose let's take, um, I can take either of these cases. Suppose, let me just do the second one, say a bit of time. Suppose we say alpha is equal to 0. 0.5. Then um, what does that mean? That means that the private uh, social valuation Essentially, the social valuation of one dollar of private gain from uh, profit shifting is 50 cents. Well, what you then get is that the Pareto efficient rate is 15%. Uh, so that would say, again, this is this is you know, if you were a, if you were a 12 and a half percent country uh, in our little model, not the real world, if you were a little, if you were a 12 and a half percent country and you are faced with a minimum of 15%, actually you should be quite happy because that's actually your preferred, that's the minimum rate that does the best for you that is possible. Uh, in that case, however, you still gain even if the rate uh, is as high as 17%. So in a way, these, these differences probably sound small, um, but actually they're quite large in terms of the policy debate. If you think about your 12.5% country, going to 17% sounds pretty scary. But in this sort of world, it's saying that actually 17%, you're still better off than you were at 12.5% uh, in, in the in the in the pre in the unconstrained, uncoordinated equilibrium. So they are kind of, uh, I would say these differences are potentially material. One point just to note, something I hinted at before, one thing we're ignoring in all this, or in this presentation, not in the paper, is that well, you know, at some point the uh, minimum tax is going to bind on the high tax country too. Um, and that arises when this condition is, uh, is satisfied. That gives rise to all various possibilities uh, that are actually account for some of the complications in the table you just saw. But I just want to kind of be honest and mention that I'm, I'm missing that, uh, missing out that here. So with that, uh, Christos, maybe I can try to try to wrap up. Um, I hope more or less on time. Just to mention then, what are, what are the kind of the lessons and what, and maybe say a little bit about a couple of uh, extensions. Well, the first lesson I think is is fairly straightforward, but I think is not one that's been much taken into account in the in the debate, which is that strategic responses really potentially matter quite a lot in assessing uh, these minimum tax proposals, figuring out where the minimum should be, who the winners are, who the losers are. For that assessment, the slope of the high tax country's best response is really important. That's really what determines, remember those expressions I gave for mu star and mu double star, which depended on the slope of the best response. Um, broadly, those were both higher, the uh, steeper the best response was. And in our model, the question that then comes up is, well, what do we think is the relative value attached to the private gain and the public loss from profit shifting? Although having said that, from the point of view of the low tax country, it really doesn't matter what drives the slope of the high tax country's best response? What matters is how big or small that response is. I think we've tried to argue that the efficient and maximal dominant rates may be materially above uh, the initial low tax rate. So in that sense, perhaps uh, we're um, pushing the case for maybe being more ambitious on the minimum rate than, than uh, may currently appear to be the case. And then finally, just to mention a couple of extensions, uh, we do in the paper also consider the case where you care not about Pareto efficiency, that is making both countries better off, but on some notion of collective efficiency. 
uh, as if there were transfers available and there are various characterization results there, but of course the bottom line is that both of these rates uh, tend to be much higher. Um, you know, I think we tend to, we would tend to argue, well, look, when you think about negotiations in something like the inclusive framework or explicitly in the European Union over tax matters, actually getting everybody on board is really quite important because in the European Union, of course, unanimity is required for any tax matters. So I think we think this um, individualistic Pareto approach is quite important. We talked too about, well, what if there are many countries? Uh, so suppose, for example, instead of having this high tax country and a low tax country, we had another country in the middle. Well, what happens then? Um, again, we grind through this a little bit in the paper, but I think the intuition is fairly straightforward. Then you get another kind of a ripple effect because when you increase the minimum, say on the lowest tax country, now the one in the middle is going to increase its tax rate in response to the, to the minimum on the low tax country which is another reason why the rate in the high tax country goes up. So the kind of impact of the minimum kind of ripples throughout the distribution of tax rates. And that tends in a way that is easier to state intuitively than to formulate precisely. But that I think if anything is going to strengthen the case for, for some degree of ambition in uh, setting these, uh, these minimum rates. So I think, uh, Christos, with that, I'll, I'll finish. Happy to answer any questions or, or say more on things. But um, I appreciate people bearing with me, as I say, on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, may not be the easiest way for people in Europe to wake up, but um, thanks, for, thanks for bearing with me. Thank you very much, uh, Mick. Uh, uh, this is fascinating and highly topical uh, you know, uh, presentation. Uh, you know, there is a there is a question in the chat box which I'm going to read out oh. uh, for you. Uh, okay. Would it be correct to assume that if one allowed investment effects, i.e., that the m and uh, profits would be reduced by higher taxes, then we add a new negative welfare effect and so reduce the calibrate minimum taxes? This is a question from Lackis. Uh, but it, well, I didn't catch the light of us, so I'm just trying to, I thought I should yeah. try to stop, yeah, let me, stop. No, let me stop the screen. Let me stop sharing my screen. Let me, let me, yeah, let me read it again. Would it, be, okay. would it be correct to assume that yeah. if one allowed investment effects, that we would add a new negative welfare effect and so reduce the calibrated minimum taxes? Um, All the way from Australia. Could be. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it's necessarily true because, oh, as you know, once you have, once you have real capital going on, <clears throat> and say you have effects on world interest rates, it can kind of go either way. So I think I could construct examples where it goes either way. Um, you may remember all these older models where you have, you know, it depends on whether the low tax country is a capital import or an exporter and what happens to world interest rates and so on. Um, so I'm not sure it unambiguously goes in that direction. Um, so I don't, I don't know, I think it would think that would be assumption specific i think that one but it's it's a fair point and um uh, and one that we do ignore yeah we would we, we'll just uh you know back on time but uh, i i've got i've got a, a small question for you uh make uh yeah. uh I, I guess in 30 seconds if you can give us uh your your, your insights uh is 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 is, is the devil in the details regarding the success of the agreement and the carve out uh carve out uh, uh you know uh, uh discussion mm -hmm. The uh, you know, so some countries uh, you know contemplating or discussing you know wanting a very generous you know, substance based you no know, carve out and you know, some others not. Um, I think um, I think in a sense yes. I mean partly because I mean I think the model for the pillar two people I think are now working through these uh, the model rules that were issued. Um, I think the thing that people are getting nervous about is that historic though this agreement is, it's not a simplification. I mean, we knew that the um, the previous system was extraordinarily complicated. And I don't think anybody presents this as a, as a simplification. And that's partly because I said, well, it has all these kind of fundamental uh, different features, but there, it's not it's not as if there's a kind of coherent vision that that's bringing all these things, the, all these things in. So I think coming back to your point, all these things are supposed to be implemented by 2023. And I think that the, the, there's a lot, I mean, you know, there's a lot of changes countries have to make to do that. So I think a lot of the pressure, a lot of the, the detail is really coming home in countries realizing, well, can we really do all this by 
by next year, including pillar one. We haven't got the model rules for pillar one yet. So, um, I mean, in principle, you know, countries are signed up to this. Um, maybe hard for many countries to, to step back, but I think uh, you're right, the detail really matters, both in implementation. And I think in terms of, um, in a way, coming back to Lucky's question, even some of these investment effects do depend on things like this carve out. So, so yeah, there's certainly a lot of detail and it's uh, devilish to, uh, to come to terms with it, if that's probably the best, best answer I can give. Yeah. On that note, uh, I mean, oh, thank you very much for joining us. And oh, thanks for asking. It's, uh, it's, it's been great, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank Bye. Bye-bye. All the best.